الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاك الله خير for coming today إن شاء الله we know we've just started now hopefully there'll be some uh, more people coming but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your efforts for arriving here and obviously participating today before we uh, begin proceedings we should start with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to soften our hearts and inshallah make sure the malaika are here uh, registering this for our efforts today inshallah so I'll ask brother Muhammad to uh, recite some of the ayat of Quran just by way of reminder um, while the Quran is being recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَمِئُ لَهُ That when the Quran is being recited, listen to it, give it a ear. وَأَنْسِتُوا لَأَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ That you should listen to it attentively and make sure you uh, get the barakah from that. So inshallah, I'll ask you to uh, listen attentively. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا قيل لهم لا تفسدوا في الأرض قالوا إنما نحن مسلحون ألا إنهم هم المفسدون ولكن لا يشعرون وإذا قيل لهم آمنوا كما آمن الناس قالوا أنؤمن كما آمن السفهاء ألا إنهم هم السفهاء ولكن لا يعلمون وإذا لقوا الذين آمنوا قالوا آمن وإذا خلوا إلى شياطينهم قالوا قالوا إنا معكم إنما نحن مستهزئون الله يستهزئ بهم ويمدهم في تغيانهم يعمهون أولئك الذين اشتروا الضلالة بالهدى فما ربحت تجارتهم وما كانوا مهتدين مثلهم كمثل الذي استوقد نارا فلما أضاءت ما حوله ما حوله ذهب الله بنورهم وتركهم وتركهم في ظلمات لا يبصرون سلام الله عليكم Okay, the last 18 months, all of us in this room, I'm sure at some point, would have heard or seen or witnessed in some way, shape or form the massacres and killings in Syria and Egypt. Whether that's via Facebook, WhatsApp, in person, I know brothers who have gone there to do charity work and they would have seen and heard the images coming out from those countries and the brutal situation that the Muslims over there face. And the Prophet وسلم, he described the Muslims in their love and compassion for one another like one body. al muslimun karajulin wahid. You're like one body, one physical body. Inna ashtaka ainuhu, that if you hate, if you feel a pain in your eye, ashtaka kullu, you will feel it everywhere. The whole body will complain with restlessness and fever. And if the head is in pain, then the whole body feels the pain and the Muslims are summoned to respond to that. And subhanAllah, we can see wherever you look, the Muslims have responded and they do fear for the situation and they do hurt and they do make dua and they want the best for the Muslims there. And the situation there is something which affects all of us. We would have seen August the 21st this year, just a few weeks ago, the chemical attack that took place 
in Syria with you know babies dying, froth foaming from their mouths, people passing away in their beds, the smell of vinegar and rotten corpses within the space of minutes, with the nerve agents and the gas killings that were done by Bashar al-Assad in Syria. While the attention has been on Syria, we would have seen the world has turned like a blind eye. While the attention has been on Syria, the situation in Egypt since July of this year has been no better. After the coup by General Sisi, we saw Muslims massacred left, right and centre. Protesters shot at, children shot at, people praying Salat al-Fajr being shot at, the masajid being closed, imams being arrested, and the situation there is no different. And today, that is one of the you know, two daggers in the body of the Muslims at the moment. Alongside many others, but our focus today will be on those two, inshallah ta'ala. We have with us three guests, three uh, brothers who have traveled far to come here today to speak about the issue and to obviously raise their points of view. To introduce all three of them, the first one, Dr. Adham al-Bakri, who has uh, traveled down today. Jazakallah khair to him for coming. He was born many years ago, but um, from Alexandria in Egypt, and uh, he joined Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood in 1987, and has been active, involved in their work, involved in their, uh, their campaigns over the last you know, 30 years or so, and alhamdulillah he's joined us today. By profession, he is a doctor, a surgeon, so alhamdulillah he's, uh, you know, he's representing Ikhwan al-Muslimin today and he'll be speaking on behalf of them. To my right, Brother Yahya. For those of you who don't know Yahya, Yahya has uh, converted to Islam uh, many years ago now and studied an engineering degree at London University and converted while he was there. He works as an IT professional, uh, and a math teacher. In 2002, um, he was arrested alongside 118 others in Cairo while studying Arabic in Egypt, and arrested there and taken by the state security services in Egypt, where he uh, you know, faced the similar fate that many of the brothers there face in terms of torture, <coughs> listening to the screams, and uh, the situation that I'm sure we are all aware of in the Egyptian prisons. He was later charged and uh, convicted in an unfair trial uh, by an emergency state security court, similar to the emergency situation we've got in Egypt at the moment, for trying to bring down the then Mubarak regime. He was adopted by Amnesty International as a prisoner of conscience, and he was released in 2006 after serving four years of a five-year sentence, and since then he has written a number of books, mashallah. Um, one of them, An Introduction to the Quran, Second one, uh, my time as a political prisoner in Egypt, and the third one, why I became Muslim. They are all available here to buy, so if anyone wants to uh, have a look at them, please feel free to look at them at the store. He currently lives in London with his wife and two children. On my left, Brother Taji, um, if you've not seen him on TV, or not seen him in some pictures in Lebanon, or Australia, or some other part of the globe, He's uh, been active, mashallah, in the work, Islamic activism for the last 20 plus years. He's uh, again another IT engineer by trade, by profession. And he also has been speaking about Islam and working for Khilafah and the, speed, uh, the media spokesperson of Hizb al in Britain. All three of them today have arrived and obviously will participate in the discussion. Some of you may be wondering why we haven't got Dr. Hani. Adib, who was also you know, invited to come, who also agreed to come today. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today because I think he's on call or he's been called into work or something, so for reasons out of his control, um, you know, he couldn't make it today. So he sends his apologies, and uh, instead we've got Dr. Adhamal Bakri, who I'm sure would be a good deputy in charge. The format for today, just a few points before we start, because it's slightly different and it's been advertised as question time, so I thought, think it would be important that we have some... Uh, uh, some, some guidelines or some rules to make sure that the atmosphere stays conducive to actually learning about Islam. The format for today is each person will have about six, seven minutes. They will give their presentations of their point of view on the situation. They will provide their bullet points, provide their opinions. Feel free to make any notes mentally or written if you, if you would like during this time, but to ask them questions or to raise some issues. Once they have done that, then inshallah we'll open up the floor for any questions. Uh, that brothers may have or sisters may have and you can raise them directly through me and I will direct it to the speakers.
few pieces of advice before we start. The Prophet وسلم, he explained that the Muslims they should love one another. And the people of Ahlul Qibla, the people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet وسلم, they are one to the exclusion of everybody else. We are one. Doesn't matter which background, which group. If you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you love one another for the sake of Allah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he explained in the hadith, said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِي I swear by the one in whose hand is my sotir, and whose soul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds, he says, you will not enter Jannah, لَا تَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ حَتَّى تُؤْمِنِ You will not enter Jannah until you believe. And you will not believe until you love one another. So we should have that atmosphere here today, inshallah, that we are believers, we want Jannah, and we love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are not here to argue, we are not here to defame or insult or anything like that, but we are here to have a discussion about the situation of the Muslims in Syria and Egypt particularly, and do that in the best possible, uh, in the best, with the best possible manners and the best possible uh, akhlaq and adab that Islam commands us. I'll finish, then I'll allow the speakers to speak with a nice quote from Ash-Shafi, he says, I never discussed with a man except that I wished Allah helped him. And I never discussed with a person except that I was not bothered on whose tongue the truth came up. So it does not matter which tongue the truth arrives at, the point is arriving at the truth. So inshallah we should make sure we keep that atmosphere with us today and that focus when we discuss and when we raise the question. I apologize also to the speakers in advance or to anyone in the crowd in advance if I ask you to uh, hurry up or ask you to, or if I interrupt, or if I stop you from giving a talk from the floor. Well, if anyone wants to arrange a talk, they're welcome to book the center again and give their talk on the day, but today is about question time, to raise it to the guests and raise the questions to them so that they can offer their opinion. After we finish, around four o'clock, the brothers are here as well. If you'd like to raise any discussions, or if there's any written questions that want to be raised, we can respond to them via our Facebook page and give the answers there as well. So inshallah, I'll ask without any further delay. Um, Taji is going first. We, we cast lots, first, second, and third. And Taji will go first, followed by Brother Adham, then uh, Yahya's uh, third, inshallah. So we'll start. I'm going to be timing them for about six, seven minutes each, and then we'll open up the floors for any questions. There should be some papers going around. You know, you can write your questions down. You can raise your hand. You can text them. There should be a number on the slips as well. You can text them to me, and I can try to get through as many as possible, inshallah. OK, this one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa la wala. Sabihu lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-awd. Lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamd wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. We are a pleasure to be here. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we thank him that he brought us here on one basis. Because as far as I can see, I cannot see many Syrians, many Palestinians, or many Egyptians in the audience. But we come here as believers in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I was asked to address um, the issue in Syria and give my thoughts on that, and uh, my other brothers will address the other issues. I think the first thing to say about Syria is Syria is the land of Islam. We came here as Muslims, and our concern for Syria is because it's the land of Islam. And it is an old land of Islam. It is the land where some of the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died in. Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. It is the land of some of the great scholars of Islam like Ibn Taymiyyah and many others. It is a land which has a strong and old Islamic history. So it is very natural that Islam is part of the landscape of this land when we talk about the land of Syria. But Syria today is something which is in the news for another reason. So I guess my second point is, what has occurred over this last two and a half years? And it's something you're aware, aware of. That this started as people seeing what happened with their brothers and sisters in Tunisia, in Libya, rising against tyrants. The people in the Muslim world are one. So when they saw that happen in Syria, you had the situation, you had what happened in Dera'a, you had young boys go to demonstrate, there was graffiti, they got arrested, they got tortured, and the family said, that's enough, enough, khalas. 
and they stood and demonstrated against the tyrant. And in Syria, this is quite amazing because the amount of fear, anybody who's been, some brothers have studied Arabic in Syria, a lot of fear, secret police everywhere in Syria and Egypt in these countries. So finally, the Ummah woke up. Alhamdulillah, this is a great thing. The fear was broken and it started, and we need to remember this, it started as people standing peacefully and demonstrating against the tyrant, saying, enough, you have to go. We will not take this anymore. It did not start as a Sunni Shia fight, as some in the Western media keep trying to push and remind us. It did not start as a call for the West to intervene. Now they claim they, they love the Syrian people after two and a half years, they want to intervene. It started and really largely remains people, largely the Muslim population, rising against a tyrant, a father and son, who have ruled, oppressed everybody in this place for the last 40 or so years. Third point is that Syria is unique. I started by saying it's the land of Islam. There's something unique about the revolution in Syria. It is not to say that the uprising in Egypt is not amazing, or in Libya is not amazing, or in Tunisia is not amazing. But there is a certain flavor in Syria, which is that when people rose up, listen to some of their slogans. Ya Allah, malna ghayrak, ya Allah, ya Allah, malna ghayrak, ya Allah. Calling on Allah, depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People calling for khilafa Islamiyah. People calling for Sharia. You see the many brigades that stand up and are fighting calling themselves the Brigade of Umar bin al-Khattab, the Brigade of Khalid bin Walid and these kind of names. There's a very strong Islamic sentiment. People feel that nobody has helped them. The West has not helped them. The Muslim rulers have not helped them. They turned again and again to their Islam. They are calling for Sharia in different guises and forms. And there are even people there, some even calling for Khilafah. This has given a very unique flavor that is a very strong Islamic sentiment. And people will tell you that those who are in Syria today, fall basically in three camps. There is the regime of Bashar, and then there are those who oppose him. Some of those who oppose him, the West is trying to bribe them. Come, we will give you some weapons. Somebody will help you in this way. Qatar will help you in this way. Trying to bribe them, to bring them on side, to call for a civil state, a secular state, a non-Islamic state. And then there are the fighters, many of them, the bulk of them, <coughs> calling for Islam, calling for Sharia, calling for the future to be according to Islam. This makes it unique. My last two points before I finish is that we now hear talk of Western intervention. Bashar has been killing people for two and a half years. Bashar, according to the British government, Bashar has used chemical weapons about 13 times before he used it in a water. So as long as they know, people have been killed, massacred over 100,000. Suddenly, in August, chemical weapons were used, and the West are now saying, we will rescue the people. This is a red line. This is hypocrisy. These are hypocrites. Really what they fear in Syria is they feel that Bashar, who has been to Buckingham Palace, dined by the British government, who they exported chemical agents to not too long ago, who Tony Blair and others met and called a reformer, who John Kerry, the U.S. Defense, the U.S. Foreign Secretary, was dining and whining with in 2009. They feel that Bashar, who helped them in the first Gulf War, who has served Western interests, may be on the verge of falling. What can replace him? Maybe the Islamists, the ones who call for Sharia and the ones who call for Islam. We reject Western intervention. We here need to stand with our own in solidarity with them. We need to make dua for them, that Allah Ta'ala give them victory soon. We need to help them whatever way we can, give charity. But we need to realize with dua and charity comes action. And realize the biggest battle in Syria today is to try to prevent the return of Islam, is to say those calling for Islam are fanatics, are terrorists, are Al-Qaeda, give them all sorts of labels, and therefore say that you can fight them. And it's to give Bashar time, which is by saying, as long as you don't use chemical weapons, everything else is okay. That's what they've said the last few weeks. Chemical weapons are red line, you gotta give it up? No problem. Whatever else, you, however else you kill the people, we reject this. May Allah Ta'ala, who is the best of planets, Aid the plans of those who work for this deen and the return of Islam. Islam, to be specific, is the Khilafah system, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. And Jazakallah khair for staying on time as well, mashallah. So, over to you, Dr.
بالله من العليم الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله عز وجل نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله العظيم من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ومن لم يجعل له له نورا فما له من نور ثم بعد دي brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. It certainly gives me a lot and a great honor to be with you and amongst you, learning from you and sharing the same hearing and learning to our respected speakers. I'm here to to give a biased view, and I have to admit that from the very beginning, so that you become very well prepared. And then uh, we talk on this ground. What I am biased to is Islam. What I am biased to is Iman. What am I biased to is the seer of the Prophet وسلم, and its uh, role model. What am I biased to is the ideology of the Ikhwan Muslimin or Muslim Brotherhood as long as it sticks to the above three ones. So here, this is a, a biased man talking about biased ideas and biased views, so be prepared. The question, for the last two and a half, three years, there has been a revolution in Egypt, what so-called revolution in Egypt, and subsequently, uh, a year ago, there was a rise of the Muslim um, background uh, president uh, Dr. Morsi, Professor Dr. Morsi, and then the termination of his ruling on the 3rd of July this year. And the very uh, famous and very uh, direct question, is this a failure of the Muslim Brotherhood to convey the message and to rule Egypt and convince the public in Egypt with the Islamic way of life, Islamic way of uh, ruling, Islamic Sharia. This is a very obvious and clear question which is very valid. And actually before talking about this we need to define few things in order to have good basis to our discussion. The first one, what is success and failure? When we talk about movements, when we talk about missions, when we talk about Islam, when we talk about Sira of Prophet As long as we are not a political party, because the political party was only founded uh, in February uh, 11, however, the Muslim Brotherhood, as you would probably know, has been there since 1928 of this century, or the last century, sorry. So the political party is not the main issue. The main issue is the da'wah, the main issue is the movement, the main issue is the mission, the main issue is Islam itself. And then we need to measure what is success and failure. If success means the continuing of the president for four years, so many votes, parliaments, the lower house, the upper house, is that a success? And I'll leave you to answer this in view of few bullet points and facts. You all know the story of Ashab al-Khudud that, that we teach ourselves and we teach our brothers, sisters, kids, daughters, sons in Surah Al-Buruj. What has happened with them? The long story, let us cut it short, believers who's been thrown into a Luhdud, a big valley, thrown alive in fire. And the question, has they been defeated? Is that a failure of Iman? A failure of Islam, which they believed in? This is the first one. In the Mecca uh, period of time, which has lasted 13 years of the life of da'wah of the Prophet وسلم, more than the Madani one, which is 10 years, <coughs> was Yasir, Sumayya, uh, achieving success or failure when they died before Hijrah, before the rise of the Islam, before victory, before Badr, before al ahzab before al before anything. 
What about other Sahaba who had uh, met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this period of time without seeing or achieving anything? Thirdly, the famous Ghazwa in Shawwal, at the third year of Hijrah, Uhud, when uh, the, the master of the martyrs, Hamza radiallahu anhu wa and followed by Mus'ab ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhu wa the first ambassador in Islam, in whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has revealed min al-mu'mina rijalun sadaqun ma'ahadullah alayhi is among those believers, men, true men, who have been truthful and faithful in whatever they have given promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so forth. What is the situation with them? Are they in failure or success? Prophet ﷺ, when he was injured badly, when he lost 70 of his companions, subsequently the next day, the another ghazwa which might be not as famous, Hamra al-Asad, those who have battled in Uhud have been recalled to go again in Hamra al-Asad by direct commanding from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibreel alayhi salam and so forth for Suhr al-Hadaybiyah and so forth for Hajjat uh, al-Wada'ah the beginning of this century the fall of the Ottoman Caliphate in 1924 followed by the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 as trying to revive Islam in life, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed it, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it to be, to be a role model in life, not only in office or in power. What has Muslim Brotherhood achieved in that? Is the last year, is it whole or none? There has been several points of success before the termination of the ruling. We can talk about da'wah as a mission. We can talk about public awareness. We can talk about changing the shape and form and the mission of the institutions in the current society in Egypt. We can, take, we can talk about the elections as a parameter and a measure. And we can talk about the rule and the office. And then we can talk about the coup uh, itself. Lastly, to end up this, I have to mention or revive uh, or uh, in fact um, remind myself and my brothers about goals which we need to measure the movements on. We, in order to, to assess anything, we have to know what the objectives, whether they have been achieved or not. The objectives of, of the Muslim Brotherhood are al the Muslim. We'll go through them with the question. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Right. So we will we'll, we'll take the questions. Yeah. Okay, it's just uh, okay. that's so, brief. so uh, the, the, the Muslim person, the Muslim family, the Muslim society, the Muslim institutions, the Islamic government, the Islamic state, the Islamic caliphate, and the uh, breaching and in fact carrying the whole message to the whole world. So when I went to Egypt uh, nearly 10 years ago, about 8 years ago, I was aware that Egypt was a dangerous place. There's a lot of fear at the time in Egypt. But it wasn't that the Egyptian people feared for me, or I feared from Egyptian people. That wasn't a fear. It was the state security, the, the secret police, the Amna Dawla, who is the, the big fear of Egypt at the time. And they were known for their harshness. They were known to arrest anybody and put them in, in continual arrest because they had what's called an emergency law. And Mubarak, the president Mubarak of Egypt at the time, 28 years he had had this emergency law. And it was still a state of emergency apparently. But because I was a foreigner, clearly I'm not Egyptian, there was no fear from me, so Egyptian people could speak frankly with me. They didn't fear that by speaking to me, they're really speaking to state security. Because the normal situation is for an Egyptian to speak to another Egyptian who he doesn't know very well, 
you're not quite sure where is the West, where's that conversation going to end. Will I be in a prison cell tomorrow as a result of this conversation? Which was the, the case for many people. But one thing I found is that Egypt is a place of many contradictions. So your son can be in prison for 14 years without charge under Mubarak's regime because Mubarak frankly ordered him to be put there but you can actually still vote for Mubarak to be the president in the next presidential election. And that's a contradiction, it seems to me. You can sit in the torture areas in the offices of La Zohli, which is the interior ministry building, that have underground cells. You can sit there and you can listen to people being tortured and electrocuted, but at the same time you can hear Quran being recited by the same man who's doing the torturing. And he'll be fasting Ramadan and he'll have a note on the wall saying, don't smoke, it's haram. So these are contradictions that appear to me. But the Qur'an is loved in Egypt. The Qur'an is read everywhere. Whether it's a torture cell, whether it's in the streets, whether it's in the prison cell, whether it's on the television, the radio, Qur'an is read everywhere. It's loved. And Islam is loved as a deen. But I have to say, there is some misunderstanding of what Islam is. And there is some mis misunderstanding of the implication of what the Qur'an's message is, which you will find as a commonplace. And perhaps that explains why we find these contradictions. <coughs> so Ali Jumma, who is the Mufti of Egypt, he would come on television and he was promoting Dar al-Fatwa, which is an institution set up to encourage people to adhere to the Sharia, adhere to the fiqh, refer to scholars in their daily lives. And he's promoting this. But at the same time, he's telling them you, there, there are five opinions on smoking. And he's on national prime time television telling people the five opinions on smoking. There's haram, there's makru, there's mubah, there's mandub, and there's wajib. And he's confusing the people with these kind of statements. So instead of actually encouraging people to refer to Islam, he's actually making people mock the fiqh because he's saying pick and choose whichever you prefer. Now, my own story, you know, we're being brief here, inshallah. I was sentenced to five years for belonging to a group which calls for the <coughs> establishment of Islam as a way of life, the Khilafah. Okay? And of course, part of that inevitably is getting rid of the Mubarak regime. So while I was inside the prison, I met hundreds Hundreds, not just hundreds, I met thousands in fact, of prisoners in exactly the same situation. All there because they wanted to see the end of the regime and they had a love for Islam and wanted to see it as the replacement, as, the, as, as what should be the dominant way of life in Egypt. I met Salafis, I met Sufis, I met Ikhwan, I met all types of Muslims inside those prisons. And overwhelmingly they were all there because of their desire to see Islam. The sincerity, the personal ibadah, the adherence to Islam was common. But at the same time, coming back to my theme of contradictions, I could feel a contradiction that the same people who were there because um, against the regime, when the flag was waved on TV, the Egyptian flag was waved on TV in a football match, they'd be jumping for joy. The nationalistic feeling was very, very strong. The, I was there at the time of the Arab Cup when Egypt won it, and it was overwhelming. I was a foreigner, so I was mocked. I wasn't even a, a part of the African Cup, but still, they're targeting me saying, you know, Egypt is so great, and I'm looking... Egypt put you in prison, but yet you're waving the flag and, and so happy to be Egyptian. It's a pride in being Egyptian. I found that to be a contradiction. Because to be proud to be Egyptian means proud of the Sykes-Pico border, which defines you. And who put that there? That wasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the British that put that there. That was the French that put that there. So it's proud of a colonial legacy. And I don't understand why anybody would be proud of a colonial legacy. Particularly when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this asabiyya, this nationalism, it's rotten, you should leave it. And he told us to stay far away from it. At the same time, Erdogan, who is the now president, the current president of uh, Turkey, he won the election. And there was great celebration in the, in the cells, in the cell blocks. A great cheer when they heard that he won the election. Because he was seen as a, somebody who was bringing hope. I pointed out at the same time, this man didn't run on a platform of Islam. He didn't claim to rule with Islam. He didn't say, I'm going to bring you Islam. But there's such hope in this man. And the point being is that under that much oppression, anything, anything shiny and sparkly seems like a glimmer of hope. And so the idea of having an Islamic person, an Islamist person in the presidential position was great hope, as if it's going to bring great change. So outside the prison at the time, I'm sorry if I'm going very slightly too long, but outside of the prison at the same time, one of our lawyers, well, who was actually from a socialist background, not really Islamic background, but he started to demonstrate against the idea of Jamal or Gamal Mubarak becoming the next president after Mubarak. 
And it started to gain movement. They started with 10, 20, then 100 people. Then they became a movement known as Kifaya. And then they started to spread across the country. And then we saw what happened over the next uh, roughly eight years, six years. Within a short time, the revolutionary spirit had taken over Egypt. The people had gone to the streets. They had lost the fear of the state security. And that is the most important point. They had lost the fear of the state security. And they had gone to overthrow the regime and get rid of Mubarak. But behind the scenes, the sad story is, is the American agents in the army, they worked to manipulate this revolution. In SCAF, they renamed themselves the Security Council of the Armed Forces, to manipulate and manage the situation. So for 18 months, they prepared the ground before they had their election, and then, you know, they had already basically secured the power for themselves, and then allowed President Sayyid Mohammed Morsi to come into power and to become the president. So when the constitution was being laid, one of the first tests of the, the presidential term, when the constitution was being laid and they were voting on the constitution, it was a constitution that actually most of the Islamic people rejected. They weren't happy with this constitution, this new constitution. It wasn't different enough to the old presidential Mubarak constitution. But then the secularists, the ultra-secularists came along with a worse proposal and then Mohammed Morsi led the whole country to vote yes, a yes campaign. All of the Islamists came on the street. Even the ones who didn't want to get involved felt, I have to defeat the secularists. So they voted for the constitution. The same constitution which they had rejected only a few months before. So again, a strange contradiction. So I'm under pressure now not to talk too long. And maybe I'll bring up some of these points, inshallah, at the end. The, to cut a long story short, as the brothers already mentioned, General Sisi came to, after one year of um, uh, President Morsi being in power, well, General Sisi came. He took the country back, he slaughtered any opposition, he murdered tens, then hundreds, then thousands, and put them in the hospitals, put them in the body bags, and that is the situation as we've left it today. At the same time, Britain, America, France, they're making excuses for him. Firstly, they're reluctant to call it a coup. Then when they finally call it a coup, they say, yeah, but he came, did it to restore democracy. And they're willing to now work with the guy as if now he has come back through a legitimate process, which they themselves would not recognize had it happened in their own country, but somehow it's all right. As if all that killing that happened is nothing. It doesn't matter. It's, it, it, was, it was necessary to bring back democracy. So again, one of these cra strange, crazy contradictions. So my last point then is that who is behind this overthrow of the Morsi regime? Well, it's the old guard. It's the Mubarak's men of the past who never really left the scene. They were always there behind the scenes. They're often called as the deep state now. That's the term that's being used in Egypt. The deep state. But I think it's a bit of a misnomer. It's not really the deep state. They're not really hidden. They actually were the state. They're the ones who actually had the real power. But there was a veneer. A veneer of democracy on top to say, you can vote. You can choose. You have a president who can, who can make decisions. In reality, once they decided they wanted the power back, they took it back by force and they slaughtered everybody who is in opposition. And there's much more to be said on this, but I'll end there as a brief introduction. Jazakallah khair. Right, I've already got about 20 questions, but I'll start while trying to I'll take a mix of written questions, questions from the floor, some text messages that we've got, and some of the questions that people raised on the Facebook page as well. I'll try to direct the questions so that everyone gets, all three speakers get opportunity to speak on them and obviously give their point of view and their responses for each question. Sorry. We'll, uh, before we start, sorry, just a reminder, brief questions, to the point, please, if you've got a particular speaker that you want to respond to, direct it at them, but no uh, long comments or talks, feel free to arrange your own talk if you'd like to give uh, a talk each other. But quick question. And uh, we're trying to get through as many as possible. Okay, Bismillah, we'll go first. Brother there, then Amar, then over there, I'll take some written ones. Okay, Brother Yeh, you first. Sorry, I forgot your name. Adham. 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 Okay, Adham. If there's a lesson to be learned after taking power and then having taken away from yourselves by your Muslim Brotherhood, what would that be? Okay, good question. If there was a lesson to be learned, what would that be? How long am I allowed to, to respond to the question? Yeah. And then... How long? One, one to two minutes. Right. Okay. Get uh, uh, that was, minutes. It's a very, very good and hot uh, question. And, uh, and actually, this has been the question that we've been asking ourselves for a long time and trying to, uh, to answer it. There's loads of lessons to be learned. Okay, we talked about in the introduction, but we haven't talked about what's gone wrong. There's so many things gone wrong. 
in the personal level of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood as ourselves, we are all human beings, we are people that have been and having a mission but had pulls. One, at the level of Iman, some of us has gone wrong with the Iman, some of us has gone to the dunya, some are uh, being taken by the glory of power and office and, uh, you know, uh, um, the world these things, so uh, distracted away from the essence of the Iman and some of us has gone to Ma'asi and Dunub. And this is one very important thing whenever we talk about Islam as a rule. Number two, um, there is obviously lessons to be learned about the deal or, and, and the way to deal with the military uh, at the time of the revolution. In the beginning when they promised to uh, kind of convey true and faithful elections, um, we've kind of been led to, to um, you know, kind of um, uh, listen to this or uh, believe in it. Subsequently, although some other people have been kind of looking very suspiciously to the military guys because they want to, to make a, a turnover to the, to the whole country, but we thought that the right way to do it is to carry on doing the roadmap which the military has laid to get the whole country away from that. There was very well justifications, but the outcome showed us that that was not, not the right move. Thirdly, choosing a president among the Muslim Brotherhood. In the beginning, we as Muslim Brotherhood, we said, will not uh, pr promote a president from Muslim Brotherhood to rule Egypt in this very critical uh, period after the uh, revolution. The reason was so many challenges were there, but because of lack of true and faithful candidates who agreed to take this position, we have been pushed to take it. In fact, Muslim Brotherhood has been um, uh, on and on trying with so many national faithful figures outside the Muslim Brotherhood to lead Egypt as president who has all declined the offer. So these are three main things. Um, and the fourth one, if I may end up with, is the way to kind of contain the other national movements, which are again faithful and trying to, to go for the best of Egypt, but not from the Islamic perspective. This containment we have not really achieved to do it in the best possible way. I'll take another couple of questions together and then we'll uh, ask them. Amar, then you'll find the question. This is a question for the Muslim brother. Is it Islamically allowed to? implement Islam alongside something which is non-Islamic. Okay. Brother is there? God. Yeah, you. Um, the question is, um, to all the members of the, the panel, yeah. is, ha has, do we have any confidence in democracy given that it failed in Algeria, given that it, it failed in Palestine with Hamas, and given that it failed in Egypt with economists? Okay. I'll take one more, bro. Yeah, so my question has to do with the fact that is it even possible? Um, because everybody, everyone on the panel here wants Islam to you know, dominate in the society, to be implemented. But is it even possible to do it in the way that uh, it was done in Egypt? Um, because that was, what, that was the lesson I learned, that it's not actually possible in that framework because the, uh, the president didn't hold the power. Okay, inshallah. There's three questions there. One, is it allowed Islamically to rule by Islam and something else at the same time? Do we have confidence in democracy, bearing in mind it failed in Palestine, uh, Algeria, etc.? And is, is it even possible that we can get to Islam via democracy? If I go with Taji, then Yahya, then. then. <coughs> um, I come to that, there's a, there's, there's a few things there. I think maybe the, the, the one I would tackle is just something to remind ourselves about. Um, I mean, our, our brother, Dr. Morsi, is being held. Uh, you know, a few days ago, his family got to speak to him finally. But, you know, he was taken. For weeks, nobody knows where he was. So this was a coup in every sense. I and mean, it was uh, backed by the Western powers and, uh, as my brother said, the bloodshed. So uh, we can talk about mistakes made. We can talk about lessons we have to learn. And if we don't learn lessons, 
that will be a crime on our part. Our deen teaches us, Rasul said, the Muslim is not beaten from the same hole twice. So we should learn lessons from this. But the, apart from whatever lessons that the Morsi or some of our brothers and the Khan may have made, there's a bigger crime, which is the coup. That is a bigger crime, which is still ongoing, and which every Muslim should reject. But I think one of the arguments being put now is that Islam failed. Or sometimes they say political Islam fails. Some of the secularists, the Western media. And you know, we have to be very frank, Islam has not been implemented. In Dr. Morsi's what, one year, three days in, in power, he's a Muslim personality. This is not the issue. The issue is not the personality. But when we say Islam implemented, we have the, the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the political sphere, um, Frankly, the foreign policy was a continuation of Mubarak's. I take no pleasure in saying that. Gaza was being bombed. What was the stance? The relationship with other Muslims, the relationship with America, the relationship with Hillary Clinton, and these figures were walking into Cairo just like before. So people didn't see a substantive change there. In terms of the economic policy, the IMF loan again was taken, and that actually became a weapon used against, against our brothers in Egypt the Ummah in Egypt and the government in Egypt. Because once you have this loan, this gives leverage. The Western powers, they have leverage over you. You've now taken a loan of X billion, as opposed to doing other things which Islam said you should do. So I think we need to, when people say, oh, has Islam failed? Has Islam been implemented? Um, for whatever the reasons are, you know, some of our brothers in, in other groups, they bring some justifications and try to say they are working towards it. Okay, that's a different question we can tackle here, but I just want us to be clear. If we say Islam worked, then we can say, has Islam failed? But if Islam was not implemented in this last year, then Islam really has not been implemented. And that's something we say, well, how can Islam be implemented? Okay, just a reminder of the question as well. Is it allowed to um, implement Islam alongside non-Islam? Yeah, so you may not know much about what a casino is, and surely nobody has any experience of it, but you might have read about, you might have heard about what a casino is. A casino is a place where people go to gamble. The house, they own the rules. Okay, that's the important point. The house owns the rules. They make the rules, they set the rules. You go to play their games, you might walk away with a few extra pennies. But in the long run, the house always wins. Okay, because it's stacked in their favor. Those gambling machines you see sometimes in the chip shop, it's there to make money, it's not there to lose money. The rules are set in the favor of the person who programmed the machine. And so if a person walks in to a, uh, into a casino thinking he's going to win, frankly, he needs to learn some more of the reality. It's all a trick. It's all a game in order that you lose and they win, because they will always win. So we must not be naive and think that we can walk into this casino and win. And the international political situation today is like a casino, where you have a superpower, America, supported by other Western nations who own all of the rules and impose the rules and say you have to play the democratic rule, you have to play the international law rules. And if you go into that game thinking you're going to win, thinking you can go in and come out with Islam, you have to think again. It's never going to happen. So the question was, is it even permitted? What's the very best case scenario we will ever see when we enter into democracy? You're either going to come out with fisk, with dhulm or kufr. You can't come with anything else because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described these three. He said, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَاهُمْ وَفَاسِقُونَ The same ayah, or very similar, فَأُولَاهُمْ الْظَالِمُونَ فَأُولَاهُمْ الْكَافِرُونَ So it's a similar situation. How can we expect anything but oppression, but corruption, but perhaps even the worst case scenario, even turning to kufr ourselves? That's the nature of, of democracy. It means that people get to decide the laws and ignore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's laws. So if we even bring a small op a small part of it, then we are really d making the whole thing dirty. And the best case in terms of, uh, the best example we've got is, what is held up to be example is Turkey or Indonesia, where Muslims have come, Islamic groups or Islamist groups have come through the democratic process of one, have come on top, but we do have to ask ourselves the question, what kind of Islam do we see in Turkey? What kind of Islam do we see in Indonesia? I think in reality we see a secular democratic system which is pleasing to the West and it's got nothing and is more, more suitable for the colonialists than it is for Islam and Muslims receiving the success that is, is, the, is the true success in the Akhira after all. I think we need to step back a little bit and think about a few things before we answer this question. And, and, the, and first of all, to, to, 
to try to tackle is to appreciate to appreciate very well what we are trying to achieve what we are trying to achieve. If we are coming from Derby, reaching London without navigator, without maps, without knowing where exactly we are gonna go, we are definitely going to failure and loss. We need to know what we mean by Islam as a rule, what we mean by reviving the Sharia, what we mean by Khilafah. That's a very, very important question before stepping and moving around. And actually, by doing that, we need to, to Again, look back to the model that Prophet ﷺ has achieved. This is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not worshipping Allah through only worship. We're actually worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through following the same curriculum and the same way that He ﷺ has uh, achieved and has um, uh, gone through in order to achieve the Islamic State. Islam is not about chopping uh, hands and legs and, and, and hanging people or not about uh, whipping the, the, the hands, uh, the, 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 the people who drank uh, uh, alcohols or uh, about those who, uh, who commit adultery. Or I'm sure all of us know that, but it's just a matter of remembering that. Islam is about implementing the Islamic justice Freedom is about freeing people from uh, believing and worshipping anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Rabbi said. It's about the Islam as a way of life in the society. And all of that <coughs> needs a lot of groundwork. A lot of groundwork. We need to appreciate the challenge. This is the second point. To appreciate the challenges. How many people, how many societies, how many institutions, how many organizations are working against this to happen? We need to appreciate that we are not living alone in this globe. There are so many superpowers as the, blood, uh, as the brother has, has clearly mentioned. We need to work among this to achieve what we need. El Sharia, as we all know, when it has been implemented, the famous example is about Khamr and about others. It has been through stages and gradually, and this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. This is the way the Prophet has attempted and implemented. There is no chance that we can press a button and here you go, this is Islam. No chance. Whoever wants to achieve this is heading toward big failure. So it's the matter of implementing what we want gradually in the same way that it has been implemented in the first time. And the last point about democracy, as Brother Yahya has clearly mentioned the definition of democracy in the Western view, we have another way to define democracy. As long as it does not confront or conflict with Islamic law, we accept this as a tool in the modern life in order to get Islam to the societies. Otherwise, you're just having another alternative, which is one alternative, which is the force, which is neither fruitful nor achievable. Thank you. Okay, I, I, there's quite a few points there that I think we need to come back on. But one of the, one of the points that Dr. Adham mentioned and Yahya mentioned is about obviously the Khilaf and the Islamic State. And Dr. Adham just mentioned that you can't just press a button. One of the questions, expect Islam. One of the questions that have come in, it says, some people will say that the Syrian situation is the coming of the Khilafah, and do you agree with fighting to um, establish this? So maybe I'll ask to ask this one first. Is Khilafah a possibility in Syria? <coughs> Why not? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, promised this ummah, <laughs> that this Ummah will have authority, will have unity in this earth. Where will that be? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Where will the Khilafah return? So that's a promise. We don't live day to day and do nothing knowing that Allah has promised that our rizq will come to us. We go out and we seek and get a job. We're going to work for it. So the promise of Allah is there, the job of this Ummah is to work. So whatever Muslims rise up and strive and are struggling for change, and this is one commonality in Egypt, in Syria, across the Muslim world, in Tunisia, in Libya, these uprisings have not settled. 
there is a trajectory, there is a line of movement. People are agitating, they want stability, they want their economic future to improve. They want that not just a few people benefit from the resources of the country. They want that Muslims are united. They want that they're, that they're strong, that we can solve our problems, that we can help our women in Syria, in Palestine, in Kashmir. These are the aspirations. So people are looking for what kind of system will bring that. And the slogan in this uprising, in Egypt, in Tunisia, everywhere, People want the downfall of the system. So that means whenever we are working for change, there has to be clarity. It's this word I want to stress a lot. Clarity in what we call for. We need to call for Islam. Islam in ruling. The Islamic way of life is implemented in only one type of society. That society, which is the society established by the Prophet wasallam, the Islamic society, is where the rules of Sharia are implemented. When the Muslims appoint a man, we call him a Khalifa, an Imam, and he implements the law of Sharia. This is the Islamic society to have the Islamic way of life. Anything else, to think that we can have, to, to imagine we can have a, a, a system which is not Islamic, which takes the rules of riba, which has relationship with the Western states, the Western states that are killing Muslims, which, instead of shutting the Suez Canal, this is one of the practical points in Egypt. It's not about going to war with America. Egypt is so important, so needed in the Muslim world because of its size, its population, its Islamic history, because of the Swiss Canal. If you know, just look to the map, any of you have done geography, if you want to travel east to west, you need to go around Africa. That's the long way. It adds days, sometimes longer. It affects global trade. The world needs this piece of canal called the Swiss Canal. But we find today in Mubarak Islam and after that, American warships got preferential treatment. We still find, so, so this is a practical point. You have to think we want to implement Islam. So can you have Islam in Syria? Yes, you can. You know, will you? Will it be Syria? Will it be the next Khilafah? Will it be Egypt? Will it be where? This is in Allah's hand. But wherever the Muslims are working, and brothers are struggling in Egypt, Muslims are struggling for change in Syria, in Libya. There are many calls for civil state, for democratic state. We've got many non-Muslims. It's very complex. We can't have Islam now. You're a Muslim. If you don't call for Islam, what are you calling for? Let's be clear about this. So I always urge my brothers, my sisters, you're calling for change? Call for Islam and Khilafah. Yes, it does not mean we plug a switch. I agree with the brother. We, we hit a switch and we have Islam. But we set out an Islamic <coughs> program, set out, set out a program as how Islam addresses the economy. Our Sharia in Egypt and elsewhere is full of solutions for all the different areas of life. Offer this and convince the people. Don't hide it. Okay, I'm going to come back to another point as well. Obviously, Dr. Adam has mentioned, and Taji has both mentioned about Khilafah and having an Islamic state. You can't just get it, but one of the comments Dr. Adam mentioned was the example of alcohol and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gradually forbidden alcohol, and this is the way. So, um, do the ends justify the means? As long as your aim is noble, does it matter how you get there? Okay, so what I understand from the question is do the ends justify the means? You know, this isn't really an Islamic concept, it's not part of the Islamic way of thinking. To think that whatever I do, as long as I get to the get to the results, it's fine. Because in reality, nobody lives their life like that. You know, I want to get to that door, I want to go to the bathroom, I'm just going to push you guys out of the way. In fact, I'm not going to push you, I'm going to step on your heads and get across you. And it's just to find a means. I want to go there, why shouldn't I? That's called selfishness. That's something that Islam told us, taught it, it came to raise the moral level of mankind. Not to, 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 to take us away from this base level of of thinking, whatever you want to do, just go ahead and do it and forget about everybody else. That's not the way of, way, way of Islam to be like that. So we don't base our, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, the idea that we should um, submit to whatever desire I have, whatever way I feel to do, go about doing something, is, is, is the right way, just because I feel it. That is the ibad of insan. You know, that is what, as the brother already mentioned, it's, it's what Islam came to take us away from, the worship uh, to take us to the worship of Allah and the submission, this is what Ibadah means, the submission to Allah rather than a submission to the slaves of Allah. And that's what we do. If we take the idea of the, the ends just the mind of the means, we're using whose mind to tell us how to do things. But when we have guidance, we have clear guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tells us how to do things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ Judge between them by what Allah has revealed. Nothing else but that. Okay, so if I don't do that, then I can only be called ma'asi, I can only be called sinful, because I've not done what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me to do. I can't accept, I can't expect the help 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I haven't done the simple thing of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So I, there's a, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in tansuru, in, in tansuru Allah fa yansurukum. If you help Allah, Allah will help you. Meaning, if you support the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will help you. There's a premise here. The point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only told us what to achieve, but He told us how to achieve it. It's not, it's not important that we just um, eradicate poverty. Islam told us how to eradicate poverty. There are many ahkam, many rules of Islam which aim towards that. Islam didn't just tell us to, to, to prevent stealing or that stealing is forbidden. It told us how to prevent stealing. And it told us what to do when you catch the thief. How do you deal with that thief? It's not crude. It's not a case of just chop his hand. Anybody with a sword can chop somebody's hand. You need a police force. You need to have a state structure. You need to have education for the people that they know the things that are forbidden and not forbidden. That you're allowed to steal and well, you're not allowed to steal and, and what is the co co consequence and how are you going to deal with that? So all of this is, 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 is the Islamic way to have a state which deals with things. Anything less than that, you don't really have Islam. You only have moral values and individualistic ideas. So the idea that we can, um, we can, we, we can do whatever we want to achieve any objective we feel like, that's not an Islamic, uh, Islamic way at all. I can't, I can't agree with that idea. Okay, um, any more questions on the floor? Okay. The gradual way that Erdogan has used in Turkey has resulted in just under 500 brothers being imprisoned for 1,600 years. Um, also, Shaitan whispers, using words like democracy, president, liberalism, instead of khalif, bayya, is that succumbing to the Western way of life and, and, and setting the uh, status of compromise already? Sorry, brother. No, no, it's fine. Okay, I'll uh, ask the other to answer first. Mm -hmm. Uh, before going to this, I just want to uh, to, uh, to give advice to myself and all the brothers and sisters to chill out a little bit because <laughs> because actually uh, it's it's very nice and it's very important heated discussion and, and and it shows that everyone is interested and that's part of Islam. One thing, the other thing is hope uh, and uh, looking for victory because this is the eventual end of the of everything in, in Islam and that's the promise of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala Prophet Allah. So we're not here to, to cry or to be sad or to get depressed. We're just here to, to feel more cheerful and more, more in hope and, uh, and, and more confident in Allah's victory. Going back to this very important question. Now, about terminology. Is that, um, terminology, is that something fixed or is that something variable? And I'll leave you brother to and other brothers and sisters to answer this question when we know that that uh, 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 Sayyidina Abu Bakr was called the Khalifa whilst uh, Umar was called Amir al-Mu'mini so terminology is not fixed this is an important thing to mention to start with the important thing is about the content and the, and the role n not about the name and this is very important about al-asma wal musamayat the names and the actual subject of what the core of what we are calling number two uh, about the the democracy and about um, the westernized uh, system and so forth as said it's not about the the, the goals um, just five means um, it's about actually a bit of flexibility in which Islam has given you. Islam has got fixed things, you've got the fixed faith, you cannot afford to change your faith, you cannot afford to change your belief in the, in the pillars of the Iman, pillars of Islam, you cannot afford to change the way of Prophet in achieving the final goal. What you need to, or what I need to, to, uh, to be uh, aware about is that Islam given me the flexibility because I'm living now in the 16th century, not in the 1st century. And I'm dealing with people different from the others. And there is a very famous saying of Umar al-Khattab al and it's, it's coming in a matter of breeding children, is don't get your sons similar to you because they have been uh, created for an age and uh, 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 state different from whatever you, you you've been into. Uh, our sons, our children, our societies 
are in different ages and we have to have this. Islam doesn't get our hands kind of captured or tied to our back, but he gives us the core, which is the Quran and the Sunnah and the way and the manhaj and so forth, and, and then leave us to have the means as long as they are in the boundaries of Islam. So stepping on one's neck in order to reach the window is haram. But if you can't go around here, around there, ask someone to, to get you a place, or even if you don't have seating, you can jump in the, in, in the air and reach. Okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I agree with a lot of what's just been said, of course, and alhamdulillah, we agree upon more of them than we disagree. So, alhamdulillah, you know, sometimes I get a little excited, so forgive me if I'm getting passionate. Um, the issue of language, I agree that Musammiyat, the, the names of things, is not something which is fixed. If Allah SWT gave a name for something, then we should use that name. It's obviously the best name. It came from Rabbil Alameen. But the meanings is more important. However, there's a problem when a word already has a, a negative meaning. If we adopt that word, then what we're doing is we're adopting the negative meaning with it. So I can't start calling all of the masajid churches. You know, I can't start saying, put that Quran aside, let's call it the Bible now. I can't. Why? Because people misunderstand that. Supposing somebody came to me and in a conversation said, they didn't really know much about Islam, and says, oh, you're going to, you, you know, that Mus my sister's not Muslim, so she might say this, you're going to, like, is it the Muslim church you're going to go to? I might say yes. Why? Because for her, it's helped her understand something. But if I go now and say, right, now I'm going to tell all the people I pray in the church, what do you think <laughs> they're going to say about me? They're going to say, yeah, here's a Christian. They're not going to say he's a Muslim. So what I've done is I've confused the people. And our big problem today, and I didn't get a chance to say that, but my, my point that I wanted to end on in, in the little introduction is our problem today as an Ummah is confusion. Confusion about the details of the deen. Yes, Islam has the way of it, has fixed things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sent His Messenger to, to, to tell us, explain what is in the Quran. So sometimes He explained with clarity, and we cannot differ with that. And sometimes He explained in a way which is mujmal, which is unclear, and we have options and choices, and there are many decisions to make in that regard. For example, one ruler or 20 rulers? 10 rulers, 50 rulers, what is allowed? Rasulullah said, if one man comes to disunite you when you are united under one man, then kill the latter. When you've given bayah to Khalifa Tain, when you've given bayah to two Khalifas, then kill the one who's disputing. So clearly, it's a qat'i matter, it's a clear matter from Islam that we can only have one ruler. That's the objective. Even if people are adopting, say, okay, in the meantime, as a beneficial strategy, we'll allow a few rulers, but we're aiming towards one ruler. Okay, but at least it should be very clear that we are aiming to one ruler. That is the Sharia. All of this is not the Sharia, but we're using it merely as a way to get to the Sharia. Make it clear. And our problem is in when we use language, as I, I, I forget the exact ayah, maybe you can correct me because I, I, it doesn't come to mind quickly. Rasulullah by the Jews in Medina, he was called Ra'ina. Okay, Ra'inun, Ra'iruna, Ra'ina, Ra'ina. Okay, which means our shepherd, which is actually a good word in Islam, but also it means something negative in the Jewish language, which is very, you know, Hebrew is close to Arabic and it means a negative word, something, you know, not to be respected. So they used to use this word, and I, this is where I forget the eye, Allah SWT says, don't use that word, use another word, it means the warner. Huh? Unzurna. The one who warns us, okay, because this doesn't have a double dual meaning, and that is why to avoid confusion. So democracy is one of these words. Yes, we can have what we call dem Islamic democracy, which means the Islamic ruling system where we're ruling according to Allah, Allah, Allah's revealed and we have shura and we vote on the things which we're allowed to vote on. But if we call that democracy, how can we just confuse the people? Because democracy is well trumpeted. Why does Bush and uh, Blair and Cameron and Obama and all the rest of them, why are they so keen to push democracy? They don't believe a word of it. You can see they don't believe it because they went and sent CC to organize a coup against the democratically elected ruler and then they said that's still democracy. They lied about 30 million people coming to the street and they said that's still democracy. So they don't believe it and we're addicted to using this word when in reality we should drop this word because it does have a very negative meaning and it confuses the people. It makes them desire that rather than what is the Islamic ruling system. Which could be called Imam, it could be called Khilafah, it could be called, it could be called many things but it should never be called democracy. Okay, following on from that advice to chill out a bit, we've got another question on the situation in Syria. And I think this goes to all three of the brothers as well. The question says, some people say 
we should not support the rebels or the Mujahideen in Syria. They are backed by the West. How do we respond? And another one question says, the Muslim Brotherhood, to my knowledge, don't call for an Islamic state, but call for a secular state. Can you elaborate? And do you support, do the Muslim Brotherhood support as well the situation and the uprisings in Syria? So I'll go with Taji and then back to Anthony. Um, the, the first one about uh, uh, this claim that those in the those fighting, those rising up against the tyranny of Bashar are backed by the West. This is why it is so important that we as believers understand the reality. It is part of our Iman to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we live by the Sharia, but also we know what's going on in the life that we want to apply the Sharia. So here this is a, a political reality. What I mean by this is that if you just listen to the Western press, it gives you a certain image of Syria. And one has to try to read between the lines and have a question in mind, not just to buy what is said about Syria or even all the other Muslim lands. Um, this is incorrect to say that the rebels are backed by the West. This is a general statement. Uh, only last week or the week before, um, I think it was uh, James Defense, one of the military analysis groups in the West, actually came with a report and talked about there are so many different groups in Syria. Myself, I met, um, when I went to Indonesia for a conference, I was with Hisham al Baba, who's the spokesman of Hizmet Tahrir in Syria. He traveled there from there. He, you know, he has an office in, in Aleppo. And I discussed with him the reality on the ground. And he said the bulk, the vast majority of those who are fighting, who are rising up, are from Islamic groups. They have Islamic sentiments. They are calling for Sharia, they are calling for Khilafah, they are calling for Islam, in some shape or form. This is the vast majority. And these are the ones that the West labels as terrorists. There are some people who are fighting, who come under this umbrella of the FSA, some of who the West has tried to recruit, has tried to say, um, you know, these people are the moderate ones. So this is what you hear in the Western press. They talk about the moderate fighters, meaning the fighters who will help the Western agenda, and the extremists, which is the bulk, the vast majority. So we should be very clear that you can't say all of them are working with the West. There are only very few who are. They're not really getting any support from the West, frankly. What happens in Turkey is, you know, they invite commanders to come for meetings, and they try to give a bit of weapons, because actually they have a big problem in Syria. This is a very big problem, which is a good problem. They are not sure who will work with them if Bashar falls. So they know Bashar has passed his expiry date. He can't serve the West so long. He's hated, there's been no president for two and a half. One day he will fall. Bashar. When? But they say, when Bashar falls, we don't, we don't like, you know, Bashar can no longer serve us well, but also we're afraid of the Islamists will replace him. And that is one of the reasons why this is prolonged. So um, one of our work, you know, we're here with, with the fighters on the ground. We, we meet, we interact with them, we advise them to warn them of taking any help from the West. And this help is going to be around your neck. It will be used to corrupt you. It will be used to divert you to say, don't call for Islam, don't call for Sharia, don't call for Khilafah, call for a secular state, call for democracy, etc., etc. So this is a warning, and many of them listen. And recently, you, know, you may have seen a video where you know, there was a Hizmet Tahrir and many of the brigades, there was a public pronouncement when the West was threatening to intervene, saying, we reject this intervention. This intervention, you intervene in, and they listed, you went to Iraq, you went to Afghanistan, you went to Shisha, you killed Muslims there, and you say you want to help us? We reject your intervention, and we reject that anybody here should stand with you. We should stand and work for Islam. And these are the people we should support and help and work for, inshallah. Okay, Dr. Adam, you support the situation in Syria, and the fighters. Um, it goes without saying, actually, uh, whoever is calling for Islam and wanting to fight back the, uh, the tyrant uh, ruling in, in, in Syria uh, should be supported and is supported, and, uh, and not supporting them is a big sin and a big crime, full stop. Uh, this has happened, um, this is not a legacy, this is fact. This has happened uh, in Hama, uh, where, again, it was a big massacre for for, I'd say the Muslim, I don't want really to say here Muslim Brotherhood and this and that. I, I want to say as a fact, these Muslims in Hama, 35,000 have been bombarded with uh, airplanes, uh, firefighters, and the leader movement then was the Muslim Brotherhood. 
that was in the 1980s. I mean, so, so, so that it goes without saying that support is a wager, okay? And one of the things that probably has made uh, the, the outset of uh, President Morsi a uh, little bit quicker, that he called for a, for, for a big uh, kind of conference in the uh, Cairo Stadium, where people gather themselves to watch football games and, 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 and shout for, for support Egypt. And that the theme was that to support the Syrian brothers and, and the and Syrian revolution. So that's one point which is uh, end of story, that's a full stop. Actually, I need to, uh, to allude quickly to a couple of things um, about terminology, because we, we, we seem to, to have a little bit of a uh, talk about terminology. And I refer you again, I refer myself and you to Sulh uh, al-Hudaybiyah when Prophet Sallallahu was making the Sulh and with Suhail ibn Amr and, and said, and Ali ibn Abi Talib was writing that. And then uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, Uktub min Muhammadin Rasulullah ila Suhail ibn Amr. And Suhail said, if we know that you are a messenger, we wouldn't have fought you. Say, Uktub min Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And Prophet Sallallahu imagined how much pressure is on this great Sahabi to write this. And Prophet Sallallahu is ordering him to erase the word Rasulullah. Rasulullah, to erase this word and say from Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And then, what did Ali uh, uh, did? He, he refused. He said, I'm not going to erase it. How? Because he's Rasulullah. But then <coughs> Prophet وسلم, he erased it himself whilst he's the Prophet. This is in the fifth, six years of Al Hijra. After 20 or after 18, 19 years of Dawah, he accepted وسلم, to erase his, not, not the terminology, the actual facts as Rasulullah. Okay, this is one thing. The other thing is Hilf al Fulul. Hilf al Fulul, uh, that was in the Jahiliyyah before Islam, and Prophet ﷺ said, If I'm invited to join this Hilf al Fulul in Al Islam, I would have agreed this call for. Because this was calling for justice to support the suppressed or the oppressed against the transgressors. It's all about facts and about the call, not about the terminology. We need really to hit this very, very hard because we got kind of dislodged or um, uh, led or misled from our own track. Last point is whom we are talking to. If we are brothers and sisters, that's a lovely, great crowd of brothers who are, can see in their eyes and faces and shapes. They are having the Islamic attitude and sisters who are all, mashallah, and coming from a Islamic perspective. We are talking about this group amongst ourselves about terminology of Islam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded Prophet to illa rahmatan to whom? To the Muslimin or to the Multazimin or to the Islamic movement or the UK Islamic mission or the Muslim Brotherhood or the Hizb al Tahrir or the Salafis or No. Illa rahmatan lil alameen. We need to have a universal way of speech and delivering the da'wah. Otherwise, we fail in our mission. The failure to, rec to recognize this means we fail to convey our mission. So my, 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 my concern is not with the word. My concern is not with the, the, you know, the, the, which word we choose, except for it's the confusion that comes with choosing a word badly. Um, in the case of, uh, you know, um, Sulh Hudaybiya, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was following a policy, and that policy was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he is the Prophet. And the situation was very emotional, so Ali radiallahu anhu could not do it because of the emotion connected with it. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, I will do this, I will stick with what I've been commanded. So he's going to do what he's been commanded, regardless of whether the people agree, disagree, because it's what he's been commanded. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it as a great fakh as a great victory. And it was a great victory, but people didn't realize that until the next year when they opened Khaybar. So the, 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 you know, the, the reality of using the word or not word, he wasn't replacing with a kufr word, he was just using it a word which, you know, just choosing not to use a word because he'd been guided to not do that. 
to, 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 it was permitted to do that. And there was nothing negative um, about the choice of word he used. And it was a truthful statement. And the Hilf al-Fudul is about protecting the innocent. It's about standing for justice, as, as, as the Prophet just said. So it's, it's, it is telling us, Rasulullah some statement is telling us, it is in Islam to protect the innocent. This is a good thing. And it doesn't matter what the name of that agreement is. Any agreement which stands up for justice, whether it's Muslims or non-Muslims having a dispute, and there's a just side, the Muslim will always stand on the just side. And that is the Islamic way. But the important point with all of this is the concept which underlies all of it, which is called compromise. When are we allowed to compromise? I am allowed to compromise in Islam. I'm allowed to compromise all kinds of things. If my wife says we're eating rice there and I say I want bread, we're eating rice today. I'm allowed to compromise. No problem there. Why? Because that's a permitted compromise. If, 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 we, if, if we compromising on the choice of words which don't have any, um, don't confuse the people, no problem. But whether, if I'm choosing my words and compromising the deen as a result of it, compromising some of the Islamic concepts, the Islamic ideas, then it's not clear. And my da'wah to the people should be a shiny example of light. I'm conveying the message of Allah SWT to the world. I need to have a language which people understand that this is a unique message. I don't want to use a language which people get confused and they start to think, oh, it's, there's nothing new in it. It's the same. We had that years ago. Oh, human rights, yeah, we got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah Britain invented it. Oh, um, what's it called? Magna Carta? Britain invented the Magna Carta. We, we, we're the first ones to get... No, no, I'm confusing the people. I want to say that Islam came with justice before the British knew what justice was. In fact, British justice isn't really justice. Islam is the only true justice. And what you're doing is pretending at justice. But I'm not going to say that to insult the people. I'm saying that because that's the reality and I want to bring you something closer to Islam. You know, but anyway, there's a lot of different opinion related to styles of da'wah, how you can choose, which words to choose. That's not the important point. The important point is the concept which you are conveying to the people. Do we rule with Islam or do we say it's all right to leave Islam on the side? Do we say that Allah's Sharia is, is supreme or do we say, to be honest with you, it's just a choice amongst many choices, choose which one you like. If we're saying this, the latter, then we are, we're leaving Islam on the side, we're making it irrelevant for the people. So we need to make sure that Islam is seen as relevant and we present the Islamic solutions to problems. So I uh, wanted to uh, comment on this point. Uh, because, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, the, our brother, the doctor, said we should chill. It's very good advice, so we should all chill out, yeah? Um, but you know, subhanAllah, when you're having some discussions, especially about Egypt right now, this, it may sound like somebody to be a pedantic, a uh, very nitty-gritty discussion about this word, democracy. In my view, it actually goes to the root of the issue of Egypt. We have to learn some lessons. We have to learn some lessons. People have been killed and murdered on the street by Sisi. So, going forward, do I want Sisi to remain in power? Do I want to say this coup is legitimate? No. Going forward, do I call for the return of Dr. Morsi as the head of the democratic government in Egypt, the return of the status quo to what happened before the coup? I also say no. Why? Because democracy, this is a key issue. Dr. Morsi, individual Muslim, we've seen pictures of him praying, etc. The question is not about sincerity of somebody from Salafi, Sufi, Tahriri, Quran. The question is, what are you going to rule society by? What did Allah allow us, permit us, order us as Muslims to rule by? And this is where people then say, well, it's democracy, it's democracy, it's democracy. So let us be very clear, what do we mean? When people say democracy in Muslim countries, in Pakistan, in Egypt, in my experience, they mean either one of two things. Some people, when they say democracy, they mean voting. We've not been able to choose our ruler for years. Mubarak was imposed upon us. Hafiz al-Assad was imposed upon us. The Saudi king was imposed upon us. Voting is a good thing, isn't it, brother? To that question, I say, yes, voting is a good thing. But then I follow it up and say, who says you can't vote in Islam? Who says voting, electing, choosing the ruler is against the Sharia? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith said, the Muslims, we have the authority to choose the ruler, we give the bay'ah. We appoint a man to rule us according to the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as he does that, he deserves obedience. The day he deviates from that, he, he does not deserve obedience. This is what Islam teaches, you know that I know that. The second meaning, so when people use democracy in this way, I said, look, let's just say voting, yeah, voting. And Islam allows voting and selecting ruler, Islam allows that. The second meaning of democracy is really what is widely understood in the world and especially in the West which is that it is, it is more than elections. 
it is that you elect somebody. And this person sits on top of a system. In this system, you have a parliament or a senate or a house. You elect representatives, and they make the laws. It's not the Sharia that has the final say. It's not Islam. God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God Allah Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No. It's what the people decide. Yeah? For the sake of good relations with the West, we should allow American warships to go through the Swiss Canal. What does Islam say about that? For the sake of good relations, well, we have to take loans from the IMF because this is what the world is nowadays. What does Islam say about that? This is haram, haram, haram. So democracy is actually a system whereby you have to take the views of everybody in, in a parliament, in a senate, in, in consideration. And this is what has happened in Egypt. That is why I oppose the use of the word democracy. Not because I disagree with any Muslim brother who says we should elect a ruler, but to say this is the ruling system. Why use this when we have something better, something which really brings change, which is Islam, which is a khilaf system. Why call for democracy when we have khilaf? Okay, there's two brothers, one there, and one there, and then inshallah, I've got some more written questions. Assalamu alaikum. Right. Um, you, you talked about being honest and honest to the ummah about what you called for and the words that you used. Isn't it about time that Muslim groups that call for uh, democracy or call for politics or work with politics have had their days? Isn't it more now about the fighting that's going on? in Syria and in certain places with the Mujahideen, we always talk about the Mujahideen. Isn't it time that we, we strengthen them and we support them and we aid them? And what is our message to the people in the West? Is it that we need to go there and fight and support them? Is it that we're too weak and the fitness is too great? That actually nothing will happen? Maybe it's the end of time? So, okay, and brother there. Okay, that's right. Okay, so um, inshallah we'll take this one. And uh, yeah, you go first in this one. I get the point. It's saying, why are we wasting our time talking about words and which words to use when we should be supporting the Mujahideen in Syria? I get the point. You're right to a certain extent. And, 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 and we're not supposed to be having a, a finicky, finicky discussion and, and debating whether we're going to call it Salat al-Fajr or Salat al-Subh or something like this. We're not. We, if, if that's what people have understood what we're talking about, then stuff for Allah, I've really confused everyone. The point I'm trying to say is that he's compromised. And that is the heart of the problem in Syria today. Why is that, am I saying that the issue is, is compromise in Syria? Because they are under enormous pressure today to compromise. So the Syrian National Coalition, is un, which is a creation of America and Britain and lives in Turkish rest, uh, what they call it, restaurant? No, hotels, paid for by the, the Western powers. They're there for a purpose. And they've been put there for a role to why to create a compromise solution with the Bashar Assad regime at this Geneva conference and then to wipe out the Mujahideen, to, to end the Islamic nature of the, re the revolution. So yes, get rid of Bashar, yes, make it less oppressive regime, allow some semblance of democracy, some tokens perhaps, but at the end of the day, compromise. Compromise on what? Compromise on your Islamic call. Because the call in Syria is for Islam, not just getting rid of Bashar. Getting rid of Bashar is part of it, Having Islam as the replacement is the other part of it. That's what they're most worried about. So the question is, do we compromise? And if we start to use the wrong words, then we are compromising the concept. We are changing the nature of what we're calling for. If we wave an Egyptian or a Syrian flag, people, nobody imagines in the world that I'm calling for Islam. If I raise the Uqab of Rasulullah the black and the white flags with the Shahada written on it, everybody knows I'm calling for Islam. So they've tried to label that as that the Qaeda flag. That's not the Qaeda flag, that's Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam flag. That's the flag that every Muslim has been waving. We've got them all through our houses. They're everywhere in the, in the Muslim land. You can't call that the, 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 the Qaeda flag. That's the Islamic flag. So the important point is symbols are important. He, um, you know, subliminal messages are important. The, the baggage that goes with your language is important. Because people will start to view your call as something it's not, if you're not careful. Just a reminder of the question, if I understood right, support the Mujahideen in Syria, what's our message in the West? And third, is this the end of time? Is the fitna too great? We can't do anything anyway. Okay. I'll just go directly to the question. <clears throat> um, 
and, and it's actually it, it, it's part of the uh, of the curriculum of the Muslim Brotherhood as well. Is uh, the, there is a message written by Imam Bana, the founder, saying "Had uh, means are we practical people?" Um, Islam is about, in addition to faith, about ideology, it's about practice. You can't be a Muslim just by theory or ideology or just having the, the luxury of thinking and talking. Stop. Number two is what do Muslims need to do for, for the brothers and sisters in Syria? You probably would know more than me, but it's just a matter of uh, remembering each other is that um, uh, dua is essential. Number two, financial support and humanitarian aid. Number three, if your if your question is about is about um, uh, the the armed uh, support, so I'll defer this question to the brothers and sisters in Syria to decide whether or not they need they need armed support from other people. Um, actually, we as Muslims are very very easily trapped and misled by others, and it's very very easy to 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 be kind of trapped and then uh, persecuted. For, for, for something that we don't believe in. But because we uh, had a very, very common slip of a tongue and then we got so much uh, compassion about thing and let's do this, this and the other, which is not what we need to do. And what min okay is from Fulton. You need to do what the Syrian need to, need to have. You need to support them in the way they need. Not in the way we want or in the way that some other institutions, organizations of power in the West wants to push us to do. In fact, going down this route is very similar to what's happening in Egypt at the moment. The CC and the, the, the army is wanting to pull all the crowd, Islamists and non-Islamists, Brotherhood and others, toward the bloodshed and armed struggle. And then create a similar model to what has happened 20 years ago in Algeria, and that finishes this uh, uh, part of, of the Islamic rise, full stop. And the answer is, people are aware of that, people are conscious of this, and will not go in the same joke of Malatayn as Brother Taib mentioned in the, same, in, the, in the first instance. You know, you, you have faults and you have problems that you need to take lessons from, and the lesson is not to go into this armed struggle. Okay? Whoever is wanting to do that on an individual basis, this is his decision. He need to be uh, informed or led or requested by whoever in Syria, not whoever here. Okay? So I definitely do call for support by every peaceful mean, including demonstrations, including MPs, including whatever you can, because that's what you can do, or what I can do. If you think that there is another means that you can do that I cannot, then okay, it's, it's your way. So just a reminder, maybe the last part of the question, is this the end of time? And really is um, the issue of uh, the fitna is too great? And maybe there's some other questions related to it. People are saying these things are happening because of our weak Iman. What is this about? And also Al-Mahdi. He will, he will be the one that will come and uh, sort this out. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to be those who make excuses. Because I can make excuses to you, and you can make excuses to me. But on Yawm al-Qiyamah, if there was a duty in front of us, which we refuse to do, excuses won't count. The hadith about Imam Mahdi has become an excuse for some people. What I find very strange is those same ahadith, Imam Mahdi will return, we believe it. It will be around the area of Damascus, it's long, it's detailed, we believe it. We have to have Iman in this hadith because the hadith sahih from Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Imam Mahdi will return when there is khilafah, it says so in the hadith. People forget that bit of it. So somebody suddenly he jumps and he says, leave everything as it is. This is, I'm trying to summarize the point of the Leave everything as it is. Don't work for change, brothers. Those people in Egypt who are struggling, they should just go home and sleep. Morsi kicked people out, he killed our brothers in the Islamic movement, he shut down the TV station. We should just go home, forget about it. In Syria, people rose peacefully against a tyrant. He started to fight them back with weapons. Some of the people who defected are from the army, and they have every Sharia right from Islam to fight back. Because now they're defending themselves. Now it is defense. 
Somebody is saying, forget all that. Really, what that person is saying, if they don't realize it, some people say this, don't realize it, he is saying, accept the status quo, accept the current situation. Shame on anybody who says that. Shame on them. Shame. At long last, this Ummah, me and you, who were asleep, Mubarak ruled for what? 30 something? Hafiz al Assad and his father? People were too afraid. People were too busy with their jobs, with our lifestyles. Finally, because of one man in, a, in, in a Tunisia, Bouazizi, a, a spark was lit. And because this Ummah is one, Ummah and Wahida, when people saw this uprising next door, they didn't say it's just an Algerian uprising. They said if they could rise in Algeria, we can do it in Libya, we can do it in Egypt. There is so much goodness that has come out, so much blessedness that has come out of this uprising. Does it mean everything is going to be straightforward and easy? Revolutions don't take place in one or two years, in three or four years. When you look historically, big change takes place over time. We are living through that now. Will there be ups and downs? Yes. Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala test us? Yes. But to think that we can go back home, it's what the Saudi king and his scholars want. Forget what's happening, and then bring all these arguments, Imam Mahdi, there's great fitna. Of course there is fitna. That therefore requires that those who have clarity, those who know what is the way forward, have to stand up. And that's why my message, one, we need to work within the Ummah to say, now is the time to call for Islam. This uh, gradualist approach, Let's try everything, and one day we will put Islam on the table. We're Muslims. Be very clear to the people. And this again is, is, my, you know, this is my advice, this is a lesson to my brothers in Egypt and elsewhere. You know, they are being persecuted now. Many of them died in Rabal and we should not forget that. But I say there's, there are many lessons. One of them, speak to the Ummah clearly. We call you to support the cause of Islam, and that's clear. If you're not clear about that, Somebody sees you, somebody comes along, he weaves some message, some propaganda. Now CC is saying he's going to bring real democracy. What rubbish is this? If the Ummah is not clear, how does Islam work in the 21st century? How are they going to support you? And so, unfortunately, our brother, brother Dr. CC, may Allah bless him, he didn't show that he had a program, a program to tackle the problems in Egypt. And people saw that. And I'm sorry, when people are hungry, starving, facing many problems, they don't expect you to solve the problems from day one. This is unrealistic. Nobody can do that. They expect you to have a program to show the steps. And Islam has steps. So, you know, th th there are lessons to learn and is to work now to convince the Ummah that when this current system fails, which it will fail, they should turn to Islam. But Islam meaning what? An independent Islamic state ruling by the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Muslims and non-Muslims in Egypt and elsewhere. Just to clarify, I think Haji meant uh, Brother Muhammad Mursi, may Allah bless him. Sorry, what did yes. I say? Yes. Not Sisi. 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 We've got about 10 minutes to go, inshallah, but there's two sections of questions that are linked which we'll finish on. The first section is about the scholars, and there's two questions that I think. It says, I agree with your call for Khilafah, or Islam, and work for it. But I would like some advice on how to deal with people who follow opinions of learned people like Sheikh Nuwan Ali Khan, who say that we should rather focus on personal development and not worry about Khilafah. He also claims that Khilafah people have no idea about ruling their government, including the people who are protesting in a place like Egypt. And to follow on from that is uh, one that came on the Facebook page, said the Mufti of Egypt in, uh, in Juma was all over the news saying that he supports the suppression of protesters by the Egyptian army and he is the, Muf the Grand Mufti of Egypt and as well as that as Sudais, who we all know and listen to the Khatib of, uh, of Mecca he blessed the coup in Egypt and he supported the position of the Saudi government uh, in supporting Sisi what do we say about the role of the ulama in this and the scholars compared to the normal everyday people so Adham and then Yahya and then Adham. Um, this question of two, two divisions. The first one um, is about the, the role of personal development uh, versus the, uh, the Khalifa. And, and again, I just want to, to, to put back the basis of this uh, question is that if uh, 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 Mr. Khan means that uh, whenever we put the essence of the right believer, the right person uh, as a foundation or as a start and then build on it, 
till we reach to the stage of the Khilafah or Soviet Alam or, or, or the ruling of the Islam. Okay, um, so I don't have a problem with that. However, if he says that personal development and then be a separate unit and then forget about anything else other than, than, uh, than the personal development means that leave alone and let alone the, the Khilafah, let alone the Islamic State and let alone the Islamic government and society, I have a serious problem with this. So, so there is a clear distinction as in, uh, as in uh, stages and gradual achievement of these stages and whether or not this is the confined goal. And I've clearly mentioned in the, in the beginning uh, that the objective of the Muslim Brotherhood is the, uh, for the Muslim and the person, the, uh, the, the Islamic person, or the Muslim person, the family, the society, the institutions, the state, the government, and the whole country, and so forth. So this is the first part of the question. And the other one is it's about solutions. I just want to follow on, on Brother Tanj's very important and rich point, which means that clear program that President Morsi has conveyed or not conveyed. And being one of the Muslim Brotherhood, and I'm, quite, I'm proud to, to be of that, as I'm proud of Islam, does not mean that I just close my eyes against all mistakes or faults because there have been mistakes and faults and lessons to be learned as the brother mentioned in the first place. One of the problems was the, the clarity of the program. We did have a project named the Civilization Project or the Bashrua al nahda and this has been a little bit more general, not very specific to tackle the exact problems with exact answers and solutions. And this is to follow on the fact that I just mentioned and admitted in the first place that Muslim Brotherhood was not well prepared. None of any other Egyptian or Islamic movements was prepared to the moment of ruling Egypt in 2011. Full stop. This is a fact. None has been prepared, none has been ready. So whoever has been a little bit in a more of a preparation in the stage of preparation has to be pushed to take this otherwise leave it to the, the deep government which is now very obvious as Brother Yahya has mentioned earlier on. So subsequently the project was not very clear in the detailed way that uh, the, the know-how that uh, a Brother Taj was mentioning and this is a fact. So and now there is continuous work to make this more clear, more specific, and more to the ground, and more to the question and answers. This is number one. The ulama, the scholars. The scholars, um, this is um, a problem. It's a big problem for the public. Whenever you have the, the, the Grand Mufti saying something, and the Imam al-Haramayn, which he he make khatm al Quran and 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 make dua and cry and people cry behind him. He is the one saying that's fine. It's good for the coup to happen. And it's very difficult to answer this question because I don't want to talk about ulama because this is a, a, a faithful and moral uh, perspective. But at the same time, just discuss the idea of someone supporting a coup which has resulted into bloodshed of thousands of people, detaining thousands of people, and prosecuting others, whilst Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh you Imam of al Haramain, said, um, Whoever has killed one soul without a good reason, as if he's, he's killed the whole nation, the whole whoever in the earth. And the famous Sahabi, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, has stood in front of the Kaaba and said, I know how sacred you are, but a drop of a blood of a Muslim is more sacred than you. So how can the Imam of Al-Haramain neglect this? and neglect the scenes of people burned and killed, youngsters, ladies, women, uh, girls, people have lost their families. How can you neglect all of that and support the coup now? How can we agree with this from the Islamic perspective? 
I'm not talking politics here. I'm talking Islam. I'm talking Quran. I'm talking Hadith. Whoever negates this have a serious problem with Quran and Hadith. The last thing to mention, when we talk about uh, 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 the, the, the position of the ulama, unfortunately, the grand imam in Al-Azhar has been at some point one of the supreme political committee of the ruling party at Mubarak's regime and he still is in power and he's still in place and the whole thing has changed but not him and that gives you an idea of what's happening okay, okay so I mean I have to answer the, the, the points in my head actually sorry um, it will come to the point you're mentioning um, the, the issue is, is look, look what's happening in Syria how could anybody with even an ounce of, not even just Islam, not even a man, just an ounce of humanity, just a human being. How can somebody who looks at 100,000 people slaughtered by their ruler and not feel that they want to get involved and do something to support them? I doubt the humanity of anybody who doesn't feel that. And of course, I'm doubting the humanity of a lot of people here. So it's not just from your deen, it's just from your, your nature as a person, as a human. But then at the same time, to tell us that we should ignore that and have nothing to do with that because our mind is not strong enough yet, that's nonsense. I doubt the humanity of the one who can make such a claim. Who can doubt the Iman of the Syrians who go out every day and get killed? How can you doubt the Iman of the Muslims in Egypt who went to the squares, they saw their friends killed. They went back the next day, many more of them, they saw many more killed. They went back the next day and they saw many more killed. They kept coming. And they kept coming. Are you doubting the Iman of all these shuhada? No way. We're not saying they have weak Iman. These are the peak of Iman. These people are the strongest Iman. They have more Iman than all of the ulama who sit on their couches and didn't dare to enter into Rabi Aut al -Nahda. So I'm not asking, I'm not, I'm not saying we are not ready as an Ummah to make a sacrifice. But we are unclear on some of the details represented by some of these ulama. And it's clearly who, don't, who don't, don't understand the details themselves of the deen or wish to hide it for their own personal gains, who knows. So for example in Egypt, Yas Ibrahimi, who is now um, telling the people, he came in a, 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 an article a few days ago saying these people who call for Khilafah, they don't know what Khilafah is and then you know you have General Sisi again he's trying to dig at the Ikhwan, he's saying um, well actually Mustafa Higazi, the strategic advisor to Sisi he told the Telegraph, and he's in the paper today political Islam is different to democracy it needs fundamental questioning the ideology has never had an intellectual foundation but it has an abstract slogan Islam is the solution it doesn't have its solutions for the issues of human life that are sound and rational. These claims are rubbish, okay? Whether they're trying to point the finger at a group or not a group, they're slurring Islam here. All of these people who attack the call for Khilafah and say none of these people understand it yet. Actually, they haven't started to open the books of Quran and Hadith themselves. All of the details are in there. The, the fiqh is not a new fiqh that we've just invented. It's been there for 1400 years. We have a dastur, we have a complete, this is one of the volumes, we have two volumes. This one only talks about Nidham al-Iqtisadi, Siyasat al-Aqlim, wa Siyat al kharijiya The foreign policy, the education policy, and the economic policy of a Khilaf state. We have another volume. We have the details. The understanding of the deen is present, but it's not present amongst the people. So that's the only point I would say. That's where the grassroots work is done. And I agree absolutely with the brother. You can't turn a switch and get Islam. You need grassroots report. If people say when they mean build the Iman, they mean build the understanding of the deen, build the willingness to sacrifice for the sake of the deen, based upon understanding what it is you're sacrificing for, I agree 100%. Definitely we need that work. But to say nobody's ready yet, that's not true. Half the Ummah is staying there ready. They're going out, but unfortunately we're being betrayed by our ulama, we're being betrayed by, our, by some of the leaders, unfortunately, all of the leaders currently today. We're being betrayed by these political leaders. So we need to have an awareness so we don't get betrayed by them. So we don't fall into their traps and, 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 and end up making, a, you know, making big mistakes. Okay, last question, inshallah. They're all connected to this uh, topic about what we can do. And what is our responsibility here and what we should do leaving this room. So I'll read out some of the questions and then inshallah I'll ask the brothers to comment on it and then we'll, uh, we'll finish up with that. The first one is, how do the Muslims actually work towards this khilafah? We understand it's an obligation, but what do we do? 
Are we allowed to do things like demonstrate? Why is it important to demonstrate? What are your evidences to show that these things are allowed? As we know, women of HD are demonstrating tomorrow for children and women of Syria, which we'll announce at the end. And what do you think, uh, doing marches and these things, are they productive? And do we really make an Islamic change when we do them? Did the Prophet ﷺ practice them? And the last one, what can Muslims do in Britain? What should we leave with to actually help our brothers and sisters, not just talk about it? So if I go, Taji, I'll do that. I want to start with uh, kind of like your last words and not just talk about it. Um, brothers and sisters, there's a bugbear in my head, yeah? You know, sometimes you have a bugbear. Ah! Don't belittle talking. The Quran is full of words. It's just a book. It's Quran, brother recites. It's just words. These words, when understood by people, it changed desert Arabs, backward people, to become pioneers who brought Islam, implemented it, and carried it to save the rest of mankind. And due to their work, of course, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we in this room, I don't know if there's any brothers from Mecca here, or Medina, yeah? Most of us in this room, we're not from Mecca or Medina, where this ayat, these words were revealed. So when people say, oh, brother, you know, more than just talking, this talking is the start. Umar ibn al-Khattab was a jahil, ignorant person in Jahiliya. But he had some good qualities. He had potential. Islam came, shaped his mind, convinced him to struggle for the sake of Allah, not Jahiliya. Convinced him to be brave for the sake of Islam. Convinced him to be soft sometimes, even though that was not his nature. Because Allah said that when he's dealing with the people who are less powerful than himself, even though he's the Khalifa, the Amir Mu'minin, he has to be soft with them because Allah will account him. So he was soft at some times when Allah said, he was harsh at some times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. This is how the words, these words, these powerful words that Allah said in the Quran, if they were revealed on a mountain, the mountain would shatter. The mountain would shatter because the mountain would understand the meaning and the power of the words. Our problem sometimes, me and you, me included, then we don't appreciate the power of the words. So don't belittle talking. If you want me to move in the right way, talk to me first. Convince me. If you convince me that's the correct way to land, then I'll follow. If I'm not convinced, I'll go here, here, and here. And that's why we're talking in this meeting. So we convince each other, we remind each other of our deen, we share ideas. What does Allah Sala want us to do? What does Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say we should do? Um, okay. And um, what we can do here? What we can do here is whether it's Egypt, whether it's Syria, number one is to have awareness. There is a lot of misinformation about what's going on. Yeah? Oh, the, the, the rule of, of Dr. Sisi, Dr. Morsi in Egypt, this brought instability. Well, the, the coup was to bring stability. Oh, in Syria, these rebels, they're all backed by the West. You shouldn't support them every day. They're backed by the West, which is backed by the Zionists, which is backed by Israel. So if you back this. This, this, there's a lot of whirlwind. That means we need to be aware of what really is the picture. And what makes us aware is Islam. In Egypt, people stood desiring Islam. Whether it, whether it was not implemented, we know there were mistakes, but the desire. Why do people vote for, for Ikhwan Muslim? Why? Because people want Islam. And this, in their view, represented Islam. This is a good sentiment in the Ummah. And we need to encourage the sentiment. We need to learn from it. Explain and make a clear case of what is Islam going forward. Khilafah, Sharia, and how it tackles the social economic problems of people in day-to-day -day life. And to build a strong opinion, a strong understanding of that in every layer of society, that when this democracy, when this dictatorship, when it fails, the alternative we should turn to, which Allah Ta'ala wants, is Islam. And that means you need to explain to them. That's why we publish things like this. Go to your relatives, your friends, and make one clear message. The future of Egypt and anywhere else in the Muslim world should be the Khilafah system. Likewise, Syria, the future should be so that the Ummah becomes the fertile ground. Everywhere in the Ummah, this idea is very strong. It is from this strong ground where it has been cultivated with this idea, Sharia, Khilafah, unity of the Ummah, this is from where the Khilafah will come. Not from a soil where people don't understand Khilafah, they're confused, maybe we should look to the West, democracy, and all this confusion. 
So let's give our charity to help our brothers. May Allah accept it from us. Let us make dua for them. Let us stand against the propaganda that calling for Islam in Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, or anywhere else is backward, is repressive, is extremism, cannot look after the Muslims. We need to be the ones dealing and discussing and crushing these arguments and showing Islam can look after the Muslims in Egypt and elsewhere. Indeed, for centuries. How are you therefore giving us propaganda today? So we need to be the voice of the Ummah, supporting in every way and calling for the correct Islamic solution for her future. Dr. Adam, any closing remarks on this question about what we can do? This is a very important thing to, to try to discuss, and I don't think that I have the full answer, but I'm just trying to share with you what I think about it. Um, first of all, we need to be part of the solution because it, I have a very clear thing in my mind that probably some of us, if we are not part of the solution, we are part of a problem. So we need to be working actively to be part of the solution. Otherwise, we are working passively to be part of the problem. So this is one thing, and if we didn't take anything out of this meeting, apart from this idea, this take home message is being part of the solution, then be it, then that's enough, from my point of view at least. Number two, um, just quickly about demonstration, um, uh, what's the evidence of that? Um, because I know that so many things happen and then brothers and sisters wanting to have an evidence for it. Uh, regardless of whatever, we need really to ask this question every time about means. Now, Prophet has uh, permitted the first demonstration in Al Asr al Makki where two rows. Uh, in fact, uh, two rows of one on top of it was uh, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the other one was Umar ibn Khattab, and they woke in uh, Mecca uh, saying La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and calling for Islam in public. So, demonstration is part of the Islam. Demonstration is part of the Islamic means. Now, between brackets, so many ulama in different parts of the world, of the Islamic world, say that this is bid'ah, and I, I cannot see how. Full stop. The third part is the media, and uh, in Egypt and in so many other Muslim countries, we suffered bitterly from the media. The media has made the right wrong, and has made al haq battle, and has made the true false because of the repetitive um, uh, calling for wrong ideas and implementing them and kind of seeding them in the mind of the public. Very unfortunate to say that the media was worse than the military coup itself. And still it's acting at the moment. So the brothers and sisters of who are mu'mins and who are believers and have this slogan of being part of the solution need to find ways of affecting and influencing the media here in the West. You do have the privilege here to work with the media in different ways, you find the means, I don't, I'm not going to say what, being internet, Facebook, uh, uh, radios, TV, whatever it is, but media is essential. Human rights, we have to use this slogan to call for the human rights from the Islamic perspective, and Hajat al-Wada is a very good example of the human rights. Now, Brothers and sisters, we need to go back to, to the essence and the basics. The essence and the basics is how can we, as Muslim, be good models. We are tackling today Syria and Egypt, and we've been tackling Burma, and we've been tackling Palestine, we've been tackling Iraq, and we've been tackling Muslim countries one after the other. And they are just wounds, and in my medical terminology for a cancer, they are just metastases, okay? Branches of a main problem. The main problem, there is no obvious Islam in office, in life, in the life of the individual Muslims, in the life of the nations, as it's supposed to be. And we need to hit this in the core, not in the periphery. In the core, we need to call ourselves, our sons, our daughters, our families, our friends to 
revive Islam in ourselves, to practice Islam in ourselves, to be good examples in ourselves at home, at work, at neighborhood, in our nations, in our societies. I'm not asking you to go back to fight with Egyptians or to go back to fight with Syrians or with Burmans or whoever, but fight the, the, the fight your corner in the sense that struggle to get yourself a good Muslim, a good Muslim. This is the real success because doing this will follow on a success of all other perspectives that we've been talking about. So on the point which Dr. Adam just made, is this is the core issue, is that Muslims need to adopt Islam as a way of life and making it present and existing as a way of life which is implemented as a way of life, that is the core. Everything else is secondary to that. And that is the focus, it must be the focus of, of all work. And I, I absolutely agree that this issue of demonstration is, is, is ludicrous to say that a demonstration is not part of Islam. For the example of Rasulullah did it. It's a word. A demonstration is a word, it's speaking. Rasulullah he ordered us to forbid the munkar, to call for the ma'roof. How are you going to do that if you're not speaking? A demonstration is merely a way of telling a lot of people the same thing at the same time. So definitely demonstrations. When the Muslims of Rabi' Adawiyah are demonstrating with their lives, and their lives are at risk, then we should be demonstrating in London so they can see, or Derby or everywhere, so they can see that we're supporting them. Why? Because it gives them hope, it gives them support. Because we're saying, we agree that what is a, it's a huge munker which has happened to you. And we need to show the whole world, don't ignore this. Don't pretend this hasn't happened. Because don't forget, we've got to learn the lesson of Syria. They ignored it for a year and a half, the Western media. They pretended it didn't even exist. They pretended it was mere rumours. These little Facebook videos and these little YouTube videos were going on. We were seeing the massacre day by day, and they pretended it didn't even happen. You never saw it on BBC. If I asked my parents, what's going on in Syria? What's going on in Syria? I don't know what's going on in Syria. It's as if it didn't even happen. And then finally, it broke the media, and they can't deny it anymore. That's what CC tried to do. He tried to hide from the world what was happening in Rabi' Adawiyah in um, Maidan Nahda. But it came out. The whole world saw it. So we need to make that call public. When the Muslims are suffering, we need to be showing the world the Muslims are suffering. Because it's part of a struggle. We need to understand the Egyptians are not in an Egyptian struggle. The Syrians are not in a Syrian struggle. The Muslim Ummah is in an Ummah struggle. And it's an ideological struggle more than anything else. It's not a struggle for the ruler. It's not a struggle for the seat. It's not a struggle for anything other than the idea of Islam and to make Kalimat Allah al-Uliya to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word the highest so that the people can see with clarity what is the truth of Islam but they're trying to confuse us so here in Britain they're telling us we should be banning the niqab in some of our universities on the TV shows in the in the cork and, and so on now it's a big discussion again it's come up again whether you support niqab or don't support niqab whether you want to wear niqab or don't want to wear niqab they're not talking about niqab they're talking about your deen they're talking about you should be making a choice as a free woman because you live in a free society. You should not be obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the important point. And we need to say clearly, you should be obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's the same call as the Muslim in Egypt. It's the same call as the Muslim in Syria. It's exactly the same issue. They're just using the carb here. They're using something else over there. The issue of what can we do for Syria, if you want to help the Muslims and relieve their suffering, then send them the medicine. Send them money. Send them clothes. Send them food. They need that. If that's what you want to do, and I agree, you should do that, and you should make du'a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps them. If you want to end the problem, then don't go to your personal arsenal in the shed and get out your Kalashnikovs and send them. Because you haven't got any. There are no Kalashnikovs in the UK. You can't arm the Syrian rebels. But they do need arms. They do need physical support. They do need to end that Bashar regime. And who has the arms? All of the Turkish army is sitting on the border. They could end it in a day. The Egyptian army could end it tomorrow. Okay, I'm not criticizing President Morsi here. I'm not criticizing for his conference. Because I know, and we all know, we've seen it very clearly, Morsi in reality had no control of the armed forces in Egypt. The control of the armed forces was in the hands of Sisi, it was in the hands of Tantawi before him, it was in the hands of other people. They're the ones who bear the sin of not helping the Syrians. They're the ones who have the sin of not helping the Palestinians and the Turkish army. And in the case of Erdogan, we have to ask the question, why have you not sent the army of Syria in? You claim to support them, but why have you not sent the army yet? So that's a big question, and that is the immediate solution. The long-term solution, as Taji said, of course, is Khilafah. And how will that happen? It doesn't happen by turning a switch. It happens by clearly explaining the idea of Islam. 
clearly explaining what the Khilafah is, adopting a constitution, telling the people what is the rules of Islam, telling the people what it is that they're expected to support and sacrifice for, and then you'll see them sacrificing it. It's not the case of the Ummah is not ready, the Ummah does not know what yet to be ready for, that's the big problem. Once they know what Islam is in detail, once they are told what it is they're expected to sacrifice for, you'll see them sacrificing. Why? Because they're already crying in the masjids in Ramadan. They're already crying for their brothers in Rabi Adawiyah. They're crying for the series. They want to help, but they don't know how. You show them a path how, and they'll help. So we're not asking for a military struggle from Britain or anything like that. What we're asking for is standing up for Islam, saying the truth of Islam, telling the people what is the reality of the Islamic ruling system, the economic system, the political system, the, the foreign policy, the social system. Tell them what it is so they can support it. And that will travel. Believe me, don't think in England you have no voice. You're the only one to have a voice. What you say in Britain will travel the whole world. Because Sisi takes all of his moral encouragement from Britain and America. So they cannot say what he says in, in Masjid al-Haramain if it isn't that he's getting funded by the Saudi regime, which is funded by, well, obviously by the oil, but is organized and they get their moral support and they get all of their encouragement, their ideas come from the Americans. And Bashar al-Assad cannot do anything if he feels that he does not have the support of the West. So in reality, all of the agents that are working against us, they're taking all of their encouragement and all of their ideas and all of their struggle comes, it starts in the West. And we are at the heart, we are at the coal face. We are the start of all of that intellectual struggle. So we have, in fact, the most important role to play in all of this. Jazakallah. Jazakallah khair. We've covered so many things, there's so many questions that are still not answered. We'll be able to uh, truly chill out now for the next half an hour, 45 minutes, because the samosas and kebabs are ready. So we're going to break, but just a few announcements before we finish. First of all, um, I think the sisters have arranged, or it was alluded to as well by Brother Yahya, there is a march tomorrow in London, organized by the, by the sisters of uh, his Tahrir for the women and the children. There's transport going from Derby, if anyone's interested, any women, children are interested in going tomorrow, then please contact uh, Sister Jamila or Shaila in the crash and organize the transport team, inshallah. Secondly, Jazakallah khair to the guests coming down today for your efforts, for your time, for your words, for the brothers who have sat there and listened, for the brothers and sisters who have asked the questions and participated. Any questions that haven't been answered, please don't lynch me, but you have got half an hour if you want to speak to any of the speakers in here, and if the sisters delete the questions, we'll try to respond on the Facebook page, inshallah, and get some answers there as well. Um, as well as that, just a couple of other announcements. First of all, if, you have not all, if you're not already a friend on the Jamie Islam Facebook page, do it so keep in touch or up to date with things that we're doing, or events or circles and things like that. Uh, join us on the stall on Normanton Road, uh, 2 o'clock on a Saturday or on a Friday after Jummah. And uh, last but not least, I think uh, this, the atmosphere that the brothers have answered the questions today has been good to see. No bickering, no arguing, no immaturity, no shouting, none of that, but rather done in a brotherly way. And that's important, that we go away with that. That even if we have differences, there are certain things which we should all agree upon. And I'd like to finish with the ayah of Qur'an, which I think summarizes all of this, inshallah. And it says in the Qur'an, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوهُ تَكُمْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ كَبِيرٌ That the kuffar, they are friends one to another. Whether it's Syria, Egypt, CC, Saudi, backed by America, they are friends one to another. إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوا If you don't do this, if you Muslims don't do the same thing, then there will be fitnatun fil ard, there will be fitna on the earth, wa fasadun kabeer, and there will be a great corruption. And Imam Tabari, he says in his, in, you know, his explanation of this, he said, if the Muslims don't unify under one block, with one sultan, with one imam, a khilafah, whatever you want to call it, in one group, unified against the enemies of Islam, then you will never be victorious. So I think, inshallah, all of us, we want this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aid the Muslims in our support for establishing his deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the fitna of this world, from the corruption, from the Western ideology, from shaitan and his whispers. May Allah strengthen us to be able to deliver his message and defend Islam and stand for Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the, the hikmah and the courage and the ability to keep learning Islam. 
so that whatever challenges we face, whether it's Britain, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Syria, we have the ability to abide by the Sharia and live by Islam so that we promote it, not only in our individual lives, but as a society and as a state. Inshallah, my last dua is Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts everyone's efforts, everyone's time, and everyone's energy. Jazakallah khair again to all the brothers and sisters who have helped. May Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala accept for all of us. Inshallah, if the brothers stay seated there, the food will come. If the sisters want to go to the back room, then we shall keep going there.